Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Abralinha ao vivo, Language Online. Boa tarde a todos. Iniciaremos agora mais uma live da Abralinha, que faz parte do belíssimo projeto Abralinha ao vivo, Language Online. Uma iniciativa da Associação Brasileira de Linguística, em cooperação com várias associações internacionais, entre as quais o Comitê Internacional Permanente Linguista, a Associação de Linguística e Filologia da América Latina, a Sociedade Argentina de Estudos Linguísticos, a Linguistic Society of America, a Sociedade Linguística Europeia e a Linguistic Association of Great Britain. My name is Gabriel Diab Lotero. I'm a linguist from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, URGS. Let me tell you all that due to a kind of a hurricane we had here last week in the south of Brazil, my internet connection is a bit unstable today. I hope everything goes well and smooth, but in the case I freeze here, you know, I'm facing problems with the connection and no problem. I promise to be right back as soon as possible. We are ready here to start a talk with uh, Professor Frederick Fritz Neumeyer. Uh, welcome, Professor. Professor is uh, Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at the University of Washington and Adjunct Professor in the University of British Columbia at the Department of Linguistics and the Simon Fraser University at the Department of Linguistics. Professor Neumeyer has published uh, widely in theoretical and English syntax and is best known for, probably for his work on the history of generative syntax and for his arguments that linguistic formalism and linguistic functionalism are not incompatible, but rather complementary. He wrote many books, including two that have influenced my personal academic life. Um, thank you for that, Professor. It was Linguistic Theory in America, the first quarter century of transformational generative grammar, published in, the, in 1980. Uh, and Language Form and Language Function, a beautiful book published in 1998. His most recent book, as far as I know, is uh, Possible and Probable Languages, a Generative Perspective on linguist Linguistic Typology, published in uh, 2005. Uh, also, to my knowledge, there is only uh, one text by Professor Neumeyer published in Brazil and in Portuguese. It was an interview published in issue uh, number 14 of Revista Virtual de Estudos da Linguagem, Revel, back in 2010, 10 years ago. The interview is on the history and philosophy of linguistics, and it was translated to Portuguese by me and my colleague, João Paulo Cirino, today at the Federal University of Bahia. Professor Neumeyer uh, is a linguist, a professor, a researcher, and he was uh, president of the Linguistic Society of America in 2002 and editor of several linguistic journals with great impact in the field, such as Natural Language and Linguistic Theory, uh, Language, Journal of Pragmatics, and Language and Communication, for example. Today's talk is entitled, Can One Language Be More Complex Than Another? Professor Neumeyer, thank you for accepting this invitation to talk with us uh, here. Linguists in Brazil, we are ready to start your talk, if that's okay for you. That's good, and I'll share screen, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, can you see me? Good, and hear me. Um, Thank you very much, Gabriel. That was a very, very nice introduction. And I would also like to thank Miguel Olvier for organizing this and the Brazilian Linguistic Society Association as well. Uh, this is a terrific series and it's nice that you were able to pull this together in such difficult times. Okay, well, my talk, Can One Language Be More Complex Than Another? Um, Um, here's, uh, ah, okay, very good. Um, the consensus by the end of the 20th century was uh, among linguists is that all languages are equally complex. The first person who may have said this was a linguist named Rulon Wells in 1954, where he wrote, again, one can isolate the complexity of a language in phonemics and morphophonemics, syntactics, etc. cetera, 
but these isolable properties may hang together in such a way that the total complexity of a language is approximately the same for all languages. Um, this idea found its way into textbooks. Uh, the most popular English language introduction to linguistics, Fromkin and Rodman says, there are no primitive languages. All languages are equally complex and equally capable of expressing any idea in the universe. Um, it wasn't just Frontkin and Rodman took a generative perspective, but non-generative gr grammarians have said the same thing. Bob Dixon, the great field worker, wrote in his book, it is a finding of modern linguistics that all languages are roughly equal in terms of complexity. This is certainly not everyday popular opinion um, by a long shot. <clears throat> The 1956 edition of the Guinness Book of World Records identified, quote unquote, the world's, quote unquote, most primitive language. <clears throat> the choice was the Australian language Arunta, which is now generally called Aranda, in which, quote, words are indeterminate in form and meaning. Um, when Dixon described his field work on the indigenous languages of Australia, to the journalist Philip Wilson, Wilson replied, you mean the Aborigines have a language? I thought it was just a few grunts and groans. This is more popular opinion. <clears throat> so the question is, why do most linguists believe that all languages are equally complex? <clears throat> Excuse me, or why have they believed it? Well, three reasons. First, for humanistic reasons, since all human groups are in a fundamental sense equal, it follows, some would argue, their languages have to be equal too. Secondly, language use, the idea that if a language is complex in one area of the grammar, it's going to be simple in another. Uh, things get balanced out in this view. <clears throat> and third, internal considerations. Uh, some linguists have claimed that the nature of universal grammar demands that all languages be equally complex. Um, let's look at these one by one. Humanism, since language is the most central human cognitive faculty, to claim, some would say, to claim that human languages can differ in complexity is like claiming that human populations can differ in terms of their cognitive abilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, David Gill has written, uh, tongue in cheek, but I think he, there's a serious point here, some people seem to think that if one language were shown to be more complex than another, then it would follow that the latter language is in some sense inferior, which in turn would entail that the speakers of that language are inferior. And from there, we're only one short step to ethnic cleansing. He was exaggerating, but I think we understand his point. I sympathize with the humanistic argument but I feel that it is deeply flawed. Any child can learn any language, whether it's simple or complex. So a simple grammar, if such a thing exists, does not imply a simple mind. Also, most discussions about complexity focus on morphology. What might a simple versus a complex morphology reveal about cognition? <clears throat> Probably nothing. So let's look at the second argument, the language use argument for equal complexity. The idea is that the constraints of language use ensure that language change be a series of trade-offs, keeping all overall complexity in balance. Uh, this is a very old idea, goes back to the 19th century. But more recently, uh, many linguists have argued for trade-offs in complexity. The late Anna Siewierska, um, this again is an old idea, but she uh, did the study. Case marking tends to correlate with flexible word order. So most Indo-European Indo languages have lost a lot of their case marking, but have developed more rigid order, which seems to be a complexity trade-off. <clears throat> James Madison Soff has shown that complex syllable structure correlates with low tonal complexity. 
the more complex the syllable, the less likely it is to be a tone language. Francois Pellegrino has shown that languages that are spoken faster tend to pack less information to, into each syllable. Um, so information rates tend to be similar from language to language. Some more apparent complexity trade-offs. Languages like Chinese that have a simple isolating morphosyntax and individual morphemes that are multiply ambiguous tend to have classifiers, reduplication, compounding, verb serialization, and so on. And also complex rules of inference and rules interfacing form and meaning. In other words, simple morphology, but complex in other ways. <clears throat> An important point is the existence of trade-offs allows for subparts of grammars to differ in complexity. Uh, Vietnamese has one inflected form for each of its verbs. Archie spoken in the Caucasus has a million and a half. That doesn't mean speakers have to learn a million and a half different things, but it's much more complex nevertheless. Zhu Han, a Northern Khoisan language, has 93 phonemic consonants, while Yimas, a lower Sepik language, has 12, which I think is the lowest number. But are there always complexity trade-offs? Well, <clears throat> probably not. We'll look at some recent findings on that question later. Universal grammar and equal complexity. Some people claim that the nature of grammatical theory itself demands that all languages be equally complex. Um, it's not easy to pin down precisely the origins of this argument, um, but it probably follows not naturally, if not logically, from the idea that all languages can be analyzed with the same methodology. Everybody agrees that. Um, Chomsky in 1959 characterized the grammars of all languages as being essentially comparable despite the great complexity of each one. Chomsky himself has never precisely asserted that all languages are equally complex. Given his general intellectual style, it just doesn't sound like something he would ever say. I don't think he'd consider this discussion intellectually respectable. Nevertheless, some of Chomsky's closest supporters have made the claim that languages are all equally complex. Neil Smith, who wrote a popular book on Chomsky's ideas, has written, although there are innumerable languages in the world, it is striking that they are all equally complex or equally simple. Andrea Moro has said, if languages following Chomsky are biologically determined organs, like the liver or the pancreas, how could they differ in complexity? So Morrow wrote, similarly, if we assume biologically determined guidance in language acquisition, we need to assume that languages do not vary in complexity. Again, I'm not impressed with this argument for equal, com equal complexity. Every formal approach <clears throat> allows for peripheral aspects of grammar such as the P syntax, irregularities in morphology and lexicon, and so on, these could easily differ in complexity from language to language. Even in a principles and parameters approach, some have argued that there can be differences in complexity from one language to another. Some examples, the number of parameter settings needed to fix a language's grammar, or the relative degree of marketness can be used to calculate relative complexity. People have done that. Acquisition hierarchies lead to concrete, possible concrete measurement of relatively, of relative complexity of languages. The number of iterations of merge and or the nature of interface rules can be used to measure relative complexity. So even in a pure Chomsky and universal grammar perspective, languages could in principle differ in complexity. So interim summary, 
The evidence from theoretical linguistics is ambiguous as to whether all languages are equally complex. <clears throat> the idea that language use leads to complexity trade-offs is the one to beat if you want to demolish the idea that all languages are equally complex. But a prior question, how on earth are we going to measure whether languages are all equally complex? What yardstick will we use? There are various approaches that various linguists have taken to measure grammatical complexity. One you could call grammar-based. You just count things. You measure and compare the degree of complexity of each grammatical component. There's also user-based complexity. You measure complexity from the point of view of the language user. For example, first language acquisition. Do some grammars or parts of grammars take longer for the child to acquire than others? Second language acquisition. Do some grammars or parts of grammars take longer for the adult learner to acquire than others? Language use, are some grammars or parts of grammars more difficult to use than others? Comparing languages here. <clears throat> as far as grammar-based complexity, the person who has worked on this the most is John McWhorter. Um, he's argued that complexity can be measured along three dimensions. Overspecification, the more overt and obligatory markings of semantic distinctions, the more complexity. Structural elaboration, the more rules, the more the bigger inventories, the more complexity. And of course, irregularity, the more irregularity, the more complexity. Notice here we're counting things. Um, um, so by McWhorter's criteria, two languages he compared, Estonian is vastly more complex than Saramakan often called Saramakan Creole. Estonian genitive and partitive marking is much more semantically overspecified, structurally elaborate and irregular than that of Saramakan. Estonian has many more and more irregular morphophonemic processes than Saramakan. Um, excuse me, did I? No, that's right. Um, so, the idea is we just count things. There's objections to this idea. The biggest objections are put forward by Michel de Graff. There's no theory behind grammar-based complexity. McWhorter has no theory of languages. He just counts things. Um, advocates write about rules, phonemes, cases without going below the surface, according to de Graff. That is the units of comparison are descriptive and intuitive terms not the constructs provided by formal theory. The assumption guiding the idea that overspecification and structural elaboration makes things more complex seems to be that an obligatory distinction is necessarily more complex than an optional one. Why would you want to assume that? Um, so compare English with Nez Perce, a language still spoken uh, in the American state of Idaho, Nez Perce does not distinguish morphosyntactically between modals of possibility and modals necessity, of necessity. By McWhorter's criteria, Nez Perce is less complex than English. Does that seem reasonable? Not to me. Uh, Grammar-based complexity approaches presuppose that the more one must convey, the more complex the system. By that criterion, a language with one 10,000 ways ambiguous lexical item would be the least complex of all, which is ridiculous. Um, also, grammar-based complexity is built on the assumption that the complexity is necessarily overt, but certain types of grammars might pose more interpretive challenges than others. Walter Bizang, for example, argues that such is the case for Chinese and typologically similar languages. Sure, look at the morphology, it's very simple, but it's harder for the hearer to understand because there are so few overt signs. So let's go to user-based complexity. First language acquisition, we can start with. Do some grammars or parts of grammars take longer for the child to acquire than others? <clears throat> 
Uh, Dan Slobin has written quite a bit about this. He compared children acquiring English, Italian, Serbo-Croatian, and Turkish at four age groups. He found that the more form meaning iconicity, the more rapid the acquisition. So Turkish children learned the morphology rapidly. Turkish has a very regular morphology, but aspects of the syntax like relative clauses, they learned that relatively late. Roman Jakobsen, sorry, terrible picture, um, claimed that there exists a universal order of acquisition of elements of phonology provided by markedness theory. Uh, Pai, Ingram, and List argued that Jakobsen needs to be refined considerably. For example, the phoneme ch is learned early in Kiche, but late in English, because in Kiche it carries a high functional load. It's more frequent, so children learn it faster. So it's not just market, universal markedness that determines things. A big problem here is that some elements of grammar are learned late, not because they're necessarily more complex, but because they belong to a stylistic register appropriate either to adults or to educated people or both. Along these lines, Dabrowska showed that uneducated speakers of Polish and English master a number of constructions much later than educated speakers, or they don't master them at all. The full Japanese honorific system isn't learned until full adulthood. Is that because it's complex or is it simply because it's not considered appropriate for children? That's a complicating factor. Um, what about second language acquisition? Do some grammars or parts of grammars take longer for the adult learner to acquire than others? Needless to say, you have to abstract away from the degree of similarity of the L1 and the L2. Um, but most work devoted to L2 focuses not on absolute difficulty for L2 learners, but difficulty relative to some, for some particular L1. Um, so there's no overall conclusion about whether some languages are harder to acquire as second languages than others. Okay, third possibility, language use, <clears throat> are some grammars or parts of grammars more difficult to use than others. That's not obviously the case. After all, all existing grammars are by definition usable. I'm not sure what it would mean to claim that some languages are harder to process than others. I suppose that it would entail that for some languages it would take longer for utterances to be expressed and or to be understood than other languages. <clears throat> I don't know of any empirical work that would bear this out. There's long been the idea that certain subparts of grammar pose more processing challenges than others. So the derivational complexity, which goes back to the earliest days of generative grammar, posited that the more transformations applying in a derivation, the more difficulty for the user. But this theory implied a particular theory of grammar, early transformational grammar, which has long been abandoned. It's not clear how the derivational theory of complexity could work right now. Other investigators like Hawkins have related processing difficulty to the size of the recognition domain of the material being processed. The larger the domain, the more processing effort required. Hawkins has shown that typologically constructions that have complex recognition domains are rarer than those that do not. But even given his methodology, there's no way to conclude that some languages in their entirety are more complex than others. What about neuroimaging? Neuroimaging techniques might well shed light on relative complexity, but that's basically work for the future. Casey and Morrow uh, and Men and Duffield have discussed how difficult it is to determine neurological correlates of grammatical complexity. So measuring complexity, a summary, grammar-based complexity is intuitively appealing but is riddled with conceptual problems. There's no theory behind it. User-based complexity is conceptually coherent, 
but it's hardly begun to be developed. So we'll go back to complexity trade-offs. Is complexity in one area of the grammar in general comp compensated for by simplicity in another? In a nutshell, no, not necessarily. For, for one thing, whoever justified the claim that rigid word order is as complex as a set of case ordering, case endings, why would she, we believe that? Intuitively to me, it's much easier to learn rigid word order than complex morphology. Uh, Sevierska again, in her sample of 171 languages, nine had case marking, but rigid word order, and five had no case marking, but totally flexible word order. So it's not a firm correlation. Eldalfi in a regional language of Sweden, this is Ostendal, is more complex than standard Swedish by many criteria. Uh, the regional language has more Sandi phenomena, stress syllable types and pitch accent. Uh, Elfdalian has more case number and declension types. Elfdalian has more person and number distinctions on the verb. Um, Elfdalian has lex lexically determined case, restricted prodrop, standard Swedish has neither. So if you're just counting things, there's no way to get around that Elfdalian just seems a lot more complex than standard Swedish. I, some people have claimed the same thing about Spanish and Portuguese. Many people have claimed that Portuguese is more complex than Spanish at every level of the grammar. I'm not an expert on either, and I don't make any claims here personally. Um, according, then we come up to the question of creoles. According to McWhorter and Parkfall, the grammars of creoles are simpler than the grammars of non-creoles at all grammatical levels. This hypothesis has been hotly contested by de Graaf and many others, the two antagonists in this debate. Um, according to David Gill, Riau Indonesian is simple in every component. There's almost no word, in or word internal morphological structure, distinct syntactic categories, or construction specific rules of semantic interpretation. For example, ayamakan, literally chickens eat, can mean the chickens are chicken is eating, the chickens that were eaten, the reasons chicken eat, and so on. Gill insists that sentences such as these are vague, not ambiguous, and hence Real does not have more complex rules of semantic interpretation to compensate for its simple morphosyntax. Uh, Ian Madison uh, finds many areas of phonology where we don't find trade-offs. Languages with cons large consonant inventories tend also to have large vowel inventories. Few matter contrasts for stops and fricatives are not compensated for by more place contrasts, according to Madison. Language with simpler segmental inventories tend to have less elaborate supersegmental properties. So many areas in phonology where we don't seem to have trade-offs. <clears throat> it's simply not possible to draw any definitive conclusions about the existence of complexity trade-offs as a general feature of language. So let's turn to the social and historical factors affecting complexity. A long, a long tradition maintains that different types of language contact and different types of language identity will affect language complexity. But there's no consensus at all about precisely how. An old position is to say that internal language change involves simplification. Language left alone, it gets simpler. Contact, contact induced change involves complication, except for creolization, where pidgin speakers fall back on universal grammar. The idea is that left alone, children will generalize rules, eliminate irregularity, and simplify their grammars wherever they can. <clears throat> so English gradually reduced the number of irregular verbs over the years, and almost all of those irregular verbs that remain are high frequency. Nine out of 10 of the most common 
English verbs are irregular. Um, so word order disharmonies are a good example of contact induced complication. So Amharic originally VO, like most Semitic languages, borrowed OV and genitive noun order from neighboring Cushitic languages, but retained prepositions. <coughs> Ahom, a Thai language, borrowed modifier head order from Assamese, which is Indo-European, Indo or from some tibeto Burman language, leading to more apparent complexity. But there are many examples not involving Creoles where language contact has led to simplification. Asia Minor Great Greek lost theta and ev through merger with T and D, and it lost grammatical gender through borrowing from Turkish. Ma lost such marked Cushitic features as ejectives, labelized dorsal phonemes, and the singulative number category through borrowing from Bantu, according to Thomason and Kaufman. And there are many examples of complication not due to contact, just the opposite of what used to be predicted. So consider grammaticalization, which can increase the number of categories in a language. That's usually taken to be a sign of increasing complexity. So English has developed a separate category of modal auxiliaries, purely for internal reasons. Uh, Romance and Germanic languages have developed new categories of indefinite articles from numerals and definite articles from demonstratives. This is in historical time without influence, as far as I know, from other languages. Um, as far as social and historical factors involve complexity, the best worked out position is put out by Peter, Peter Trudgill, actually in a number of, of books and articles. His idea, little contact, that is isolation, preserves complexity, just the opposite of what people used to say. Language variety spoken in close, closed, tight-knit societies tend to develop complexity. Language contact by adults decreases complexity. Language contact by children increases complexity. So there's, there's quite a bit of support for Trudgill. So Icelandic and Faroese, due to their rel relative isolation, are more complex than Norwegian, which has experienced more contact, which itself is more complex in many ways than Danish. He must be talking about syntax because Danish phonology is terrible. It's a nightmare. Um, John McWhorter following Trudgill has argued at length that adult contact has led to simplification. As we have seen, he claims that Creoles are simpler than non-Creoles, but he, in his view, English is simpler than other Germanic languages because of English L2 acquisition by Scandinavians in the old English period. As a result, English has lost grammatical gender marking on the article and most of its case morphology. So more examples of complexity differences between related languages, according to McWhorter, Mandarin Chinese is simpler than other Chinese languages, fewer tones because of contact with Altaic speakers in the first century AD. Persian is simpler than other Iranian languages because of Persia's non-Persian subjects trying to learn the language several centuries BC. Colloquial Arabic is simpler than classical Arabic due to its spread over non-Arab speaking areas. And Malay Indonesian is simpler than other Austronesian languages due to its use as a lingua franca. You also could point to Swahili perhaps, which is simpler than the Bantu tone languages spoken around it. It doesn't have tones, for example. Uh, notice that the L2 learners don't have to be politically dominant. So Dutch simplified to Afrikaans in South Africa as a result of contact with Bantu and Khoisan speakers, even though it was the Dutch who dominated socio-politically. So if Trudgill and McWhorter are right, then why are they right? The idea is adult learners want things to be as simple as possible. Child learners don't care. Small communities are characterized by more fast speech phenomena, which lead ultimately to systemic complexity. 
and small communities develop, com develop complex systems in order to be opaque to their neighbors. There's lots of articles showing this, that people want, don't want to talk like the people do in the next valley over. There are problems, of course, with Trudgill and McWhorter. For one thing, almost every Indo-European language, I think you can say every Indo-European language has simplified its inflectional system over the past 2,000 years, even low contact isolated dialects. Why? For example, look at Lithuanian. Lithuanian is said to be the most conservative, conservative Indo-European language, preserving much of the original Indo-European inflectional and accentual system. But Lithuanian has hardly been isolated. It's been in contact for many hundreds of years with Polish, German, Russian, Swedish, Belarusian, Latvian, and Yiddish. This is throughout history. And yet it's still very complex by certain measures. English phonology became considerably more complex as a result of contact with Norman French. Um, it developed, English has developed complicated word stress rules, a new voicing opposition with fricatives. So old English didn't have a distinction between F and V or S and Z, modern English does. New alternations like vain, vanity, sane, sanity. This is a result of contact. Um, is this predicted given the nature of the contact? I don't know. Athabascan, Athabascan languages tend to have complex consonant inventories regardless of the degree of contact with other languages. <clears throat> but Hay and Bauer have found that the more speakers a language has, the bigger its fit phoneme inventory is likely to be. Many small isolated languages like Rotokas, Piraha, Hawaiian, and Maori have very small phonemic inventories. At the same time, Quechua, Zulu, Georgian, and Arabic have millions of speakers and large complex phonemic inventories. But Lupian and Dale did find an inverse correlation between population size and morphological complexity. There are a lot of conflicting results along these lines that have turned up. Also, when McWhorter and Trudgill write about small or large population size, they equivocate on whether they mean small or large in absolute or relative terms. A language can have only 10,000 speakers, but still be much bigger than its neighbors. Many West, non-Western languages once had many more speakers than today, yet the complexity does not necessarily change as the number of speakers diminishes. So um, in general, I like my talks to have really punchy conclusions where this is the way things are, this is the way things happy, happen to be, have to be. Unfortunately, this talk is not a talk like that. Um, here are my conclusions. There's no reason to believe that all languages are equally complex. However, no scale has been devised to, so far to measure the relative complexity of languages. Social and historical factors are clearly at work in affecting degree of complexity, though precisely how is still a matter of debate. Very wishy-washy conclusions, but thank you anyway. That's my talk. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you very much. Um, for the talk, uh, very intriguing, intriguing question, yeah. And uh, as you've shown, it has been circulating the linguistics field for quite a long time, and and it's still out there for debate. Yes, that's right. Great. Um, we have here two questions by Otoni Neves José Luis. Uh, I'll address for you right now, okay? Uh, so you can hear me perfectly now. Yeah, sure, I can hear you, and you stop sharing the screen so I can see you as well. Okay, good. Uh, question number one is, um, what are the disadvantages of creating a list of items in order to make an objective assessment of uh, a language's grammar complexity, such as grammatical gender, case marking, verbal inflection, et cetera, and so on? Well, there's nothing, there's certainly nothing wrong with it, and that is generally how people have talked about complexity. 
Uh, what they do is count the number of rules, they count the number of exceptions, they count all of these different things. And yes, you're gonna have some languages looking more complex uh, than others. But the question is, first of all, what do you count? Uh, do you count things that are provided by a grammatical theory, in which case you would be counting abstract co constructs, you'd be counting constraints. Um, if all, and many things might contribute to complexity that are not countable. So take Chinese again. Um, it's been claimed that it's the hearer, it's more work for the hearer to process Chinese because there are so few, because Chinese grammar is so simple. So Chinese speakers, it's more complex for them in some ways because they have to um, pull more from context, apply more pragmatics to fully interpret a sentence. So there's certainly nothing wrong if all we do is count things, um, then some languages are more complex than others. And I would say, Probably Portuguese is more complex than Spanish. Uh, Portuguese has a future subjunctive. Portuguese has more irregularity. Uh, the phonological system of Portuguese uh, is more complex than Spanish. Um, but maybe if we count other things, things that aren't easily countable, we'll find that Spanish and Portuguese really don't differ. Uh, yeah, exactly. Then we fall back to that uh, scenario where one part of the grammar is more complex. For example, Portuguese has more vowels than Spanish, but when you go to verb inflection, Spanish has a rich morphology, whereas Brazilian Portuguese has a poor morphology in verbal inflection. Yeah. So, so yeah. And another question following the first one by Otoni Neves, Jose Luis, it, um, it's related to the first one. Could these elements that you uh, ranked, uh, could they accurately reveal the complexity of a given, given language's grammar in comparison to other ones in a clear manner? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, uh, I think he wants to say that uh, could these, all these elements, uh, are they useful for our, our research in trying to investigate the more complex languages than others? and follow the path by MacArthur, for example? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that's a productive way to look at things, but again, we have to remember that's not everything because there, um, I think where this is especially of use is in second language acquisition, teaching and so on um, for, I mean, you're not, you're not gonna be teaching a language unless you know the complexities, but, conveying these to a child is something very, very difficult or not a child, an adult learner. Uh, and one interesting thing is uh, there is one study that shows that if a language has simple, morpho for simple morphology, it's easy to learn an unrelated language that also has a simple morphology. morphology. So Chinese speakers can learn Thai fairly easily, even though Chinese and Thai are not related languages, or Chinese speakers can learn Yoruba because they are very, very similar. Uh, whereas if you speak a language with a complex morphology like Navajo, um, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy for you to learn a language with a different kind of complex morphology like Georgian. So there are implications here for sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, have you met the, this uh, point that says that usually languages that, that have literature, that have writing, they can be more complex, synthetically speaking, more complex than uh, languages that don't have any alphabet, that don't have any writing system. Because when we put into writing, into writing our memory, it, it's easier to go there and, and check long sentence and check sentence with uh, center embedding, for example. Right. Um, well, written written language um, is more complex for whatever language we're talking about. Written language tends to be more complex, as you say. There's more embedding. Uh, there's more turns of speech, and and it's been claimed. Uh, well, 
Dan Everett, and I'm sure everybody in Brazil knows, knows the story, I'm not going to go back into it, has claimed that Piraha is so complex that there's no embedding. And of course, Piraha is not a written language, but other people have said, I mean, Irish uh, has been a written language for 2000 years, but most people in it have been illiterate until recently. And Jim McCluskey has shown he's taken some things from five centuries ago when there oral, the oral literature of Irish showing how complex purely oral literature was in Ireland 500 years ago. Um, when a language develops writing and becomes standardized, it can become more complex or more simple. Um, so standard German um, is a lot, is more complex than a lot of the dialects, but we look at uh, English, it can be the other way around because um, what Martin Luther did when he created by himself, modern standard German was to pick little things from different dialects and he made it work uh, where the dialects were changing on their own and are still changing. But there isn't one overriding generalization. Yes, uh, in English, for example, um, we can do things in written language that nobody would do in spoken language. Um, but that doesn't mean that the speakers don't have the ability to do it. Yeah, yeah, well, that should be uh, clear. Yes, as you pointed out in the very beginning of the presentation, yes, the, the ability of the speakers. Yes. Uh, I have always read this uh, sentence, this, this phrase, or this, this, this sentence, all languages are equally complex, not meaning as they have the same complexity, but as they are all complex. Uh, there are no simple languages. Have you ever read this the same way? Uh, well, I, I think that was the somewhat weaker position um, before uh, people starting e equally complex. So if you read Sapir or Boaz um, or Bloomfield, they say, yes, language is different complexity, but nothing follows from that about the intelligence or the complexity of the society. So Sapir made this famous quote about the Macedonian swine herd who had the same complexity as Aristotle um, or uh, Confucius and uh, Shepherd in China. Um, they weren't claiming that the languages were equally complex. They were claiming that if the languages differed in complexity, it had no effect whatever on cognition, on intelligence. So that, yes, the position you just gave was the one that was popular before. And I think everybody agrees. I mean, even Dan Everett, I think, probably agrees. Um, I mean, there are some ways that Piraha is actually complex, I mean, morphologically, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's a tonal language also. Yeah. Uh, that is complex. Uh, Luana Lambert, she gave us a question here. Uh, she asked, uh, why are Creole languages often considered an exception in some of your statements about complexity? Well, John McWhorter has an answer to that question. He says that has nothing to do, again, with intelligence or anything. He just says they're simple because they're new. Um, they, they haven't had time to develop complexity. Um, so they come, I mean, this is the standard story about Creoles, they come from pigeons. Pigeons are by definition simple. Um, and the first generation that creates Creoles from pigeons preserves a lot of simplicity. And McWhorter says, as Creoles develop over time, they get more and more complex. So look at Haitian Creole, which Michel de Graff has worked on the most. He points to Haitian Creole as it's spoken now with all of these complexities. But is it even right to call modern Haitian Creole a Creole? It has been the majority language of an independent country for 200 years. So what we have to look at is Haitian Creole when it was formed in the 18th century, not Haitian Creole now. Yeah, very different. Uh, there are recent studies with uh, recent Creoles and, and for example, the, if I'm not mistaken, the Nicaraguan sign language, 
yes. where they stated that the first users of the language, they didn't have much, um, much complex syntactic structures, much complex syntactic, syntactic structures. And uh, the kids that learn this language, they have a fully developed language as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, nobody's disputing that Creoles complexify over time. It's just McWhorter's position is they're simple because they're no. Give them time. Sure. Cecilia Rojas Nieto asks here, uh, wouldn't you agree, Fritz, that Bizang's incorporating interpretation as a factor is to be considered a crucial addition to think about complexity. I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Yeah, wouldn't you agree that Bizang's incorporating interpretation as a factor uh, would be considered a crucial addition to think about complexity? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's, it's one of the hardest things to study, uh, whereas counting irregular verbs is easy. And so um, I think I think she's right. I mean that's absolutely important. Uh, but there really isn't a yardstick for measuring any kind of interpretive complexity. I mean, what do you do? Um, time the amount of time it takes to un interpret a question in different language. It's just I I don't know how to do it. I don't know how you would do it. Okay. Thank you very much. Here's another question. I'm sorry to mispronounce the name. It's Aditya uh, Kulkarni uh, asks a rather foolish query. Wouldn't the assessment of complexity of languages based on SLA or SL uh, teaching be inconclusive until the results for all L1, L2 combinations have been taken into consideration? And my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and that's why nothing can be concluded uh, based on second language acquisition right now. Because, I mean, to me, Navajo would be a really, really hard language to learn for an Apache. An Apache would say, oh, Navajo, it's a pretty easy language because they're, they're so similar. Um, yeah, and no studies. I don't even know how, maybe you don't have to look at every language, L1 and L2, but you have to look at a much, much bigger sample than anything we have right now. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Eitor Bafa. He asks, do you believe that language change occurs any direction in any directionality going back and forth? For example, future tense mark in Portuguese, first as a free morpheme, then as a bound morpheme, and now as a free morpheme. Yeah, um, I mean, of course, so, some of language change has worked exactly that way. Um, they're called, often called the grammaticalization cycle. And talking about romance verb, romance languages verbs, you go from uh, synthetic to analytic, synthetic to analytic. Then there's the Jesperson cycle with uh, neg negation, where how negation is expressed. Uh, the language that's been studied the longest, I think, is Egyptian, um, where the record's going back the farthest. And people who have studied Egyptian just say, talk about a cycle of language change. Um, there clearly can't be anything inherent to make all languages simpler in language change. If so, every language right now would be maximally simple. Um, sometimes things happen to make them simpler but in making something simple in one way, you make it complex in another way. So look at French vowels, okay. Um, French uh, had oral vowels, just oral vowels, like, uh, not like Portuguese, but, but like other uh, Romance languages. Um, and, but when that vowel occurred before a nasalized consonant, the vowel itself became nasalized. Okay, that's a simplification, right? Because it's assimilation, but the resulting, uh, the result of all of this over time was a more complex vowel system for French because now it has a phonemic class of nasalized vowels. So nasal vowels. So yes, there, there cannot be any overall trend to language change. Um, and of course, the fact that languages are in contact with each other is 
another complicating factor because language change, as we've seen, can result in things being more complex or less complex. I mean, the hardest things about English for a non-native speaker to learn are those things that were made complicated by the Norman conquest and all the French words coming into English. So. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I, personally, I personally enjoy the part where you spoke about, uh, well, sometimes we can't just measure complexity on the things you see like uh, morphology complex or phoneme, phonemic, uh, a number of phonemes and etc. For example, we have here in Portuguese the phenomenon of uh, no subject and no object. Yes. Now, can anybody argue that a null object or null subject uh, language be more simple than an overt language with an overt subject or, or overt uh, object? Because, well, for example, in English, you have to put there three words to say, I like it. Whereas in Portuguese, you have to, you can use only one word to say, yeah. go to. Uh, does it say yeah. that is simpler or, or English is simpler? I don't know. It's, it's difficult to, to put a measure stick. Yeah. As yeah, absolutely. You can say the same thing, again, getting back to Dan Everett and recursion. Uh, what is simpler and what's more complex? Is it's, I mean, I, every language except possibly Kiraha has recursion somewhere, but how languages do recursion differs from language to language. So in English, you can have possessors recurring. You can say John's father's mother's lawyer's uh, client. Um, related languages like German, you can't, you can't do that. Does that make English simpler than German or more complex than German? I don't know. Um, so, you know, the same thing is, uh, I'm not sure how you would even test that. Uh, you would think things would be simpler if every language had recursion in every category or it had recursion in no category because children have to learn where recursion is possible and where it's not. So that might make a language more complex. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Um, Michelle de Grasse here uh, has the question. Plus the pigeon to Creole scenario is empirically and historical problematic. Uh, he's complimenting your answer. Uh, there is no evidence for that in the history of Caribbean Creoles. Have you looked at these studies, for example, uh, Muff Wien's work? Um, yes, I know I know that's uh, Michelle's position and uh, Sally Coco Mufwene's also. Um, I, the pigeon to Creole, and, and I know, I mean, Mufwene claims that pigeons, Creoles don't come from pigeons, which was, I, for most of my career, I thought, Creoles came from pigeons by definition. I thought that was the definition of a Creole. Um, but obviously that's um, uh, no longer accepted. The Creole that I've, I haven't studied any Creoles, but the one that I've read the most about is from the work of Derek Bickerton uh, on the formation of Hawaiian Creole, um, which is people call it pigeon, people who live in Hawaii, but it's in fact a Creole. and Bickerton argues, and I'm not confident to assess the correctness, but he argues in great, great detail that uh, Hawaiian Creole developed out of a pigeon, which developed from the contact situation. In other words, and this is in the 19th century. We're talking about a fairly recent, and it's a majority language of the state of uh, Hawaii, that uh, Bickerton says, well, look at the more recent things that's happened. Here we have a Creole that came from a pigeon, that came from a plantation situation, classical situation. So um, I, in terms of Michelle de Graff's question, I, I don't have the authority to say who's right and who's wrong. On the other hand, Derek Bickerton makes a very convincing case to me that Hawaiian Creole came from Hawaiian pigeon. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question here, Professor uh, Neumeyer, you feel free to say um, when you want this talk to be over. I think we have just one or two more questions anyway. Well, it's but, fine. happy to answer questions. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, Denise Pozzani asks you, do I'm you sorry, consider... Denise Pozzani, 
Okay. Uh, do you consider that the negative correlation is more transparent as a compensation measure among linguistic subsets? Uh, for example, a vowel consonant inventories, tone, syllable structure. Is this the measure, I'm sorry, is this measure more difficult to use between different linguistic levels? That's a hard question to answer and, and I'm not a phonologist. I mean, the smaller the phoneme inventory, in, in general, the greater the allophonic distribution. So languages that have three or four vowels, the range of phonetic realizations of these phonemic vowels can, can be great. So um, again, this is one of these, these questions, which is more complicated to learn, have to learn 80 consonants as in some Koisan languages or, or um, uh, a huge vowel inventory like English has, and this is very difficult for non-native speakers, get, got, gut, et cetera, the, these fine distinctions. But in English, the range of each phonemic vowel is smaller. I don't know. I mean, you can make an argument either way about which is simpler and which isn't. We have here uh, one more question. And um, Luana Lambert and Michelle de Graff are making some comments about okay. the, the Hawaiian Creole. Oh, good. Um, but it's, uh, it's available on, on YouTube. So oh. I don't know, since there are no, not questions, maybe I'll focus on the questions and then you can, you can take a look at the comments later. I can send them to you by email as well. Okay, that would be good. All right, so I'll read uh, Evanid de Carvalho. Viotti, Evanid de Carvalho Viotti wrote the question, although it's important to compare languages, what are the advantages of discussing the complexity of one language as opposed to, to another? Uh, oh, I can't. I mean, what, what, what are practical consequences? Uh, probably none, except possibly uh, in the domain of language teaching. Uh, I mean, Michelle DeGraff's position, and I mostly agree, is that there's no point in asking the question, can one language be more complex than another? Because we have no measure. There's no, there's no measure in it. Somebody proposes a measure for doing it, um, uh, then it shows that somebody else proposes another one. And I'm very, very sympathetic to the humanist position that just opening this question leads which is an innocent question, it leads to questions that are not innocent. So uh, in other words, oh, so this is a complex language, then what does that tell us about the brains of the people who speak it? And these are bad questions. These are questions we don't wanna ask, or we know the answer. We know the answer, but somebody who doesn't know the answer might be led astray to think that there are consequences. So, I mean, I. I think it's an interesting intellectual question about complexity. It might have some impact on language teaching to adults, but in fact, I think linguistics has many more questions that are more important to ask about language. And I just find this fascinating because somebody, I work in the history of linguistics, uh, it's not just syntax. And as a historian of linguistics, I just find the things that people have said about complexity over the centuries, these questions need to be addressed. Why did they believe this? Why did they say this? Um, and so I think uh, that in terms of practical consequences, uh, it's not an important question. And a more important question is how does language work? How is language represented in our brain? How is language used? The question is one language, this language more complex than that language. I don't think has very many interesting consequences. That is interest to general knowledge. It's interesting to me to talk about how these issues play out in, in history. Yeah, that's for sure. But uh, I think it's an important role of linguists, as you, as you said, that uh, we show the people that, uh, well, the, the lay people that all languages are complex and. Uh, as you said, uh, 
as you showed the example before about the journalists saying, I thought they didn't have any language uh, yeah. talking about native people from Australia. We have here uh, some kinds of the same incidents happening to indigenous people in Brazil not long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, white or Portuguese uh, people, immigrants think that uh, indigenous people have no language and etc. So yeah, it's a it's a point that you make that all languages are are worth studying. All languages are complex. It's uh, it's important, and it's an important question the history of linguistics that is uh, professor. Yes, and that that is really our most important message. Um, and I, in fact, I mean, I have non-academic friends or academic friends in other specialties uh, who don't know much about linguistics. I, I never bring up the subject with them because it just leads to too many unpleasant follow-up conversations. I just say, all languages are complex. I don't say equally. Uh, I don't say not equally. I just say all languages are complex. Uh, and I think that's the safest thing to do when we're talking uh, to the general public. Yeah, good point. Um, well, thank you, uh, Professor Neumeier. Thank you, Fritz, for this talk. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you uh, so much. Watch your presentation. Uh, would you have some final remarks, final words for the people here in Brazil and actually uh, in every every world watching to you now? Um, final words. Um, I would say the important thing for us as linguists to do is to work out grammars of languages, what belongs to universal grammar, what's particular. Um, I would say uh, the question of complexity might come up as a side issue, but that's not where linguists, uh, and I'm talking about all kinds of, I'm sociolinguists even, studying the social context of language change. Uh, that's where we should be putting our energies, not in uh, discussing my language is more complex than your language or simpler, okay? Thank you very much. My pleasure again. Thank you. Should I?